in me to make it a stadium trip. <laughs> Associate Students of North Idaho College, ASNIC. So um, today I'd like to welcome everybody to the 23rd Popcorn Forum Symposium. To, over the past years they've had many different topics and themes. Last year you might remember the UFOs and such, but this year they decided to go ahead with something that re really affects our lives. What our own lives, the privacy that we have, and how much, how much privacy we have. The title of the theme this year is Our Dissolving Privacy, Who's Minding Your Business? At this time, I'd like to introduce to you President Bob Bennett. He'd like to talk to you for a few minutes. Good morning. Well, if you saw the paper this morning, you know we had good publicity with respect to this program, so I'm hoping as the week goes on that the crowd will continue to swell and hopefully by the uh, last day we'll have this auditorium completely packed. This is a program that I'm very proud of. It's a program that, that I think gives another dimension to what we are about as a college because it takes you beyond the classroom and gives you an opportunity to hear outstanding people from all parts of the country. As Mo told you, we've had an outstanding series for the past 23 years and this year I think, maybe this is the second year now, uh, Convocations and Popcorn Forum have uh, blended their forces and their dollars to bring in what I think is going to be an outstanding week of programs. I am so convinced that this must be a part of all of your college education because uh, it's important, of course, to be in the classroom and to hear what your, your professors and your instructors are telling you, but there's another dimension to education that goes beyond what happens in this college or in this community or in this state and that is something that affects all of us as citizens of this United States. And certainly this year's topic is beautiful in terms of coming to grips with one of those forces, that being your privacy. I think you're going to enjoy this series, and I hope those of you who are here this morning will try very hard to come back to the uh, meeting this afternoon where there will be a panel reacting to the speaker's comments today, and then make sure you come back for the rest of the week because this thing should continue to grow and I think the more you get into it, the better you'll like it. I'm really happy you're here this morning. Tell your friends uh, to come, tell the people in the community to come because it's open, it's free, and a great deal of work has been uh, given uh, to make this a success. So uh, with that, I will say one more time, thank you for coming. I hope you'll enjoy this morning's program. Well, Thank you, President Bennett. Um, really quickly, throughout the week, there will be um, pamphlets like this to let you know what's going on during the week at each of the doors. And the library has put together a bibli bibliography sheet of different sources for the topics throughout the week. Um, after Mr. Press speaks today, there will be a question and answer period because he has to go back and go to work <laughs> in LA. So, um, but throughout the rest of the week, there will be question and answer panels in the afternoon after the speakers. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you Bill Press. He's the 1992 Best Commentator of the Year by the Los Angeles Press Club. He is a popular, colorful, and controversial commentator in Los Angeles, California, where he is the evening news commentator for TV Channel 13 and host of the weekly KFI radio talk show, The Last Word. Press has won three Emmys and a golden mic for his hard-hitting commentaries. Press is a member of the Los Angeles chapter of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference Board of Directors. He's a graduate of the University of Niagara in New York and the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. And he's going to be speaking on the right to privacy and overview today. Please join me in welcoming him. Good morning. Maureen, thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you for the warm welcome. I just want to echo the words of uh, your president, Bob Bennett, when he mentioned the importance of forums like this. I think the most important thing I learned in college was 
what a friend of mine taught me once I arrived on campus. He said, what I learned here, I want you to know. Don't let your studies interfere with your education. <laughs> well, I really want to thank you for inviting me to this spectacular setting. First time I've been in Curitaline, and uh, also thank you for the opportunity to participate in this uh, exciting conference. I must admit, I've done a lot of exciting things in my life. I've walked across the Ukraine from uh, Odessa to Kiev. I uh, have testified in front of Congress on many different occasions. I uh, greeted the president at one time when he walked off the steps of Air Force One, and last week I actually had lunch in the White House mess. But no honor that I've ever achieved so far compares with the honor of speaking at a popcorn forum. <laughs> and I was thinking about it, and I guess it is a good analogy for ideas, because you take little seeds of knowledge and you apply some heat, and you get ideas that are free, that are filling, and that are not fattening. So <laughs> when Tony Stewart came up with that word popcorn for him, I think he knew what he was doing. Well, I do have to admit to you, however, that I am a little nervous being this far from Los Angeles. You know, after living 12 years in Los Angeles, I don't trust clean air anymore. <laughs> I, uh, I don't trust, I only trust air that I can see, that I can taste, and I can chew. <laughs> My lungs are suffering here. But I'm also pleased to come this far from Los Angeles and with your busy campus life and other things going on in the community, I'm, I'm very pleased to see so many of you here this morning to talk about this important topic. Seeing you reminds me of one of my favorite stories about one of my favorite Americans and yours, I imagine, former Justice of the Supreme Court, William O. Douglas, who grew up not so far from here in what was then the, the small country town of Spokane and some of you may have read Justice Douglas's first volume of his memoirs called Go East, Young Man. Frankly, I wish more people had taken his advice and gone east. <laughs> but um, he tells the story there of growing up in Spokane. His father was a minister. And around Spokane, as I guess there are today, there were many ranchers who couldn't always get down into the village for, for Sunday services. And so, Billy Douglas's father, Reverend Douglas, started a series of little chapels up in the hills where he could conduct services for the ranchers uh, who, who were not able to get down to Sunday services. And Billy Douglas tells a story about one time, must be true because he tells it in his book, he went with his father to the opening ceremony or the opening service in one of these little chapels. And the hour for the service arrived and there was one cowboy sitting in the front row. And Reverend Douglas walked up the aisle and he turned around and said, would the congregation please stand for the opening hymn? And he did. And they sang the opening hymn, and Reverend Douglas said, Would the congregation please be seated? And he did. And he said, We will now preach the word of the Lord. And Reverend Douglas preached, and he preached, and he preached, and he preached. And an hour later, the word of the Lord was finished. Reverend Douglas said, would the congregation please stand for the closing hymn? And he did. And they sang the closing hymn, and then as they always do, the Reverend rushed outside so he could greet the congregation as the congregation left the chapel. And he shook the cowboy's hand and he said, yes, my friend, so what did you think of the service? And this cowboy paused and he looked up into the night sky and he said, well, I'll tell you. I ain't a preacher, I'm a cowboy. But if I had a herd of horses and I loaded my wagon with hay and I went out to feed my herd of horses and I only found one horse, I don't think I'd give him the whole load of hay. <laughs> You get the point. There are enough of you to get the whole load of hay, so uh, get ready. Here it comes. I do congratulate you for choosing such a timely topic today. The right of privacy is uh, almost every day, various aspects of it on the news and in the newspapers. I congratulate you for choosing such a timely topic. I'm somewhat mystified by your assignment to me today. You have assigned me to give an overview on the right of privacy. Well, that's easy. I can do it in three words. There isn't any. Thomas Jefferson didn't write 
Man is endowed with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and privacy. The word privacy does not exist in the Declaration of Independence. Our founding fathers did not write, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the people's right to privacy. Look for it, search for it, you won't find it. The right of privacy doesn't exist in the United States Constitution. And what's worse, more often than not, the word of privacy, the right of privacy doesn't exist in real life either. If you don't believe it, ask me. I got a telegram just two days ago, sitting at home, preparing this speech, open my mail. Here's a telegram from some lending agency that says, congratulations, Bill and Carol Press, you qualify for this loan of up to $125,000 that you can use to pay off the, the, the balance on your credit cards and to make all those improvements you want to do around the house. Obviously, somebody somewhere knows that we just got a second mortgage on our condo in Los Angeles, that we have large unpaid balances on our credit cards, and that we have been thinking about making some improvements around the place. And it's kind of scary to know that that information is out there and being used by people. Or ask Dan Quayle, or Dan Rather, the author of this book, Privacy for Sale, Jeffrey Rothfeder, when he was doing the research for his book, on his home computer, he was able to pull up the home address, the unlisted telephone number, the social security numbers, the bank accounts, and the credit card records for both Dan Quayle and Dan Rather, two of the most popular, two of the most public figures in this country, and two people whose privacy you think would be protected. And if they can get that kind of information on Dan Quayle, if just one individual sitting at home on a home computer can get that kind of information on Dan Quayle and Dan Rather, imagine what they can get on you and me. Uh, dinner last night, uh, one of your nursing instructors, is she here? She's here. Her name is Maxine. I don't know her last name. Told me the story of your local television station. Just took the license plate of a couple's car in Spokane recently, and with that license plate on their computer at the station, they were able to pull up all the information, where that couple lived, where they shopped, what their medical records were, how much they owed on their credit cards, the whole thing, one license number. Or if you think the right of privacy is alive and well, ask, ask the beautiful, young, talented actress, Rebecca Schaefer. Unfortunately, you can't. She's dead, shot dead in West Hollywood, where I live, at the front door to her home by some total wacko who got her home address, home telephone number, the kind of car she drove, and where she shopped from one of several huge private legal computer data banks. Is nothing private today? No, is what I would answer. As a matter of fact, no. Although, to be totally honest, there is one thing that is private today. You may remember in 1987 when Robert Bork was uh, in the middle of his confirmation hearings for the United States Supreme Court, one enterprising Washington Post reporter went out to the video store near where Robert Bork lived and got the records of all the videos that Robert Bork had rented in the last two years and published them in the Washington Post. Unfortunately for the reporter, there were no pornographic movies there. There was no Deep Throat. There was no Debbie Does Dallas. There were only a lot of John Wayne movies. What would you expect from a Reagan Republican? <laughs> but, um, but fortunately for us, the members of Congress were either so outraged or so threatened by that invasion of his privacy that they passed in 1988 the Video Privacy Protection Act. So I urge you this morning, if you really want to celebrate this wonderful right of privacy we have, the best way and the only way you could do it is to go out tonight, go to your video store, and rent an X-rated movie and enjoy it. <laughs> Don't enjoy the X-rated movie so much as enjoy the only act that you can exercise as a private citizen and have that act totally protected in this country today. Somehow I don't think that is what our founding fathers had in mind. And I don't know about you, I am comforted by knowing that I can watch a pornographic movie, that my X-rated movies are protected. I would be more, feel more comfortable if my bank account were protected. Well, despite these horror stories, or maybe because of them, you and I still haven't given up 
on our right of privacy. It is the least we expect of government, isn't it? I think it is the one issue on which liberals and conservatives can agree. We expect, we seek, we demand from government the right of privacy, which is nothing other than the right to be let alone. Big government. Keep it out of our homes, our offices, our bedrooms, and our bodies. The right to be left alone. Or big corporations, telephone companies, direct mail houses, banks, credit agencies, keep big business out of our homes, out of our offices, out of our bedrooms, and out of our bodies. The right to be let alone. That's what it is. No wonder that Justice Louis Brandeis, in uh, this is the most famous case, of course, regarding privacy, it was a phone wiretapping case, 1928, Olmstead versus the United States, when the right of privacy was first affirmed by the United States Supreme Court. Justice Louis Brandeis, writing for the minority, I might add, at that time, called the right of privacy, the right to be let alone, the most, here's what he said, the most comprehensive of rights, so the right of privacy is the most comprehensive of rights and the right most valued by civilized men and women, we would add today. The right of privacy, the most comprehensive of rights and the right most valued by civilized men and women. To protect that right, Brandeis concluded, every unjustifiable intrusion by the government upon the privacy of the individual, whatever the means employed, must be deemed a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Now, we might ask that if it is so obvious, if the desire for privacy is so legitimate, why isn't it mentioned in the United States Constitution? I don't know. I assume it's because it is so obvious, and it is so legitimate, and was considered so obvious by our founding fathers that they didn't feel it necessary to enumerate it. But that's not our job today. We'll leave that task up to the constitutional and historical scholars. Our task today is to put, this, to put the stethoscope to, to test the pulse of privacy today. And when we do so, what we find is shocking, scary even. For what we discover is that for something so sacred for something so universally revered and demanded, the right of privacy is in critical condition today, friends. It may even be on life support systems. There are three points about privacy that I'd like you to carry out of here today. Three points I'd like to make. First is that the right of privacy touches more aspects of our daily lives than any of the other rights that are mentioned in the Constitution. The second point is that the right of privacy is more threatened today than ever before by unwarranted government intrusion and surveillance, by unwarranted government control over private decisions we make and private acts that we perform, and especially by the rapid advance of invasive, unregulated, and ever-probing computer technology. And the third thing, I'd like you to take out here today is there are some things we can do about it and must do about it. So first, let's just think of a few ways that privacy touches us, a few examples. Sexual conduct. In Georgia and in many other states today, oral sex or anal sex even is illegal, even if performed in private, behind closed doors, between two consenting adults, doesn't matter. Two men, man and a woman, two women, illegal. And if you think that's medieval or archaic, Justice Byron White, appointed by John F. Kennedy as the great liberal, still on the United States Supreme Court, just announced his decision to retire. He is the author of the majority opinion of this United States Supreme Court, upholding the right of cops to pry into closed, behind closed bedroom doors. It's still illegal. Telephones. Well, it is convenient to have these cordless phones, you know, so you can take a call anywhere you want. I've got two of them. You can be working out in the garden, take your telephone calls. You can, uh, you know, be working in the kitchen and take your telephone calls. But 
Like with computers, with every new convenience comes a loss of privacy. I warn you today, next time you use your cordless telephone call, to a telephone, cuidado, be careful. Every secret, every obscenity, every little love word you utter on that phone can be picked up on a cheap radio receiver bought at Radio Shack and used against you. And there is no law preventing them. Cordless telephones, no law preventing copying them and using that information. Cellular phones, in fact, and I've got one of those too in my car. Cellular phones are just as easy to monitor. It is illegal to monitor cellular, cellular telephone conversations today, but that law is never enforced. And if you don't believe it, just ask Prince Charles or Princess Diana. Um, speaking of phones, how about those unsolicited phone calls that we all get around dinner time, usually made with automatic dialers, where there's a, a pre-recorded voice that says, congratulations, you just had the opportunity to contribute $100 to the Democratic Party. Slam. Uh, or how about caller ID? Don't be fooled. Caller ID, you know, this system where the number of flashes on your phone so you know who's calling you, that doesn't protect your privacy. It may tell you who's calling you, but don't you realize anybody else you call knows who's calling them? And the bank or an airline office, a travel agency, or even a dry cleaners can take your telephone number off their phone and with that, your telephone number, access all the rest of the information that you have stored in some data bank somewhere. Caller ID, the latest invasion of privacy. Don't go for it. How about something else? Credit reports. Everything we buy on credit, of course, is recorded. That information is sold. And here they come. Here come the catalogs. Here come the junk mail. Uh, speaking of buying, as we speak, the latest plan is, you know those supermarket scanners, the ones that go beep every time they take a product across it? You know those new inventions that George Bush never heard about, <laughs> even though they've been around for 14 years? Well, the latest plan is for the supermarkets to record all of that information, to get people to buy with these discount credit cards. Uh, we have that in Los Angeles at Pavilion where we shop and to record all of that information and to sell all of that information, of course, to retailers so that every little item you buy, every item you carry home in your grocery store uh, can, you know, can be used to get back at you. I mean, you can get the letter saying, Dear Mrs. Jones, you, have, you must have a, a hungry family because we see you buy a lot of frozen pizzas. You know, how about trying our frozen enchiladas? And gee, by the way, we see you and your husband practice safe sex, and we've got a special on condoms this month, too. <laughs> Uh, it's on its way. It's on its way. Now, the scariest of all for me are medical reports. You see your doctor, you buy a prescription, you get tested for AIDS. Medical records contain more intimate details about you than can be found anywhere else. And yet, medical records are no secret. All medical records, in fact, are stored in the great data bank in the sky called the MIB, the Medical Information Bureau where they are readily available to employers, government agencies, credit bureaus, insurers, educational institutions, and, of course, the media. And here is the real danger, I think, today about privacy, folks. It is not so much the junk mail that we see. It is not so much the junk phone calls that we receive. It is that people will use this information to make decisions about us without even knowing it. We can be rejected for a job application, or a, a new bank loan, or a real estate loan, or a business license, uh, or life insurance. We can be placed under police surveillance based on information on these data banks, and we never know that anybody has looked at it, and we never know that that decision has been made. Big brother, indeed. You thought your medical records were secret? Forget it. Your medical records are an open book. There are no legal protections today covering, covering medical records. And speaking of medical records, I cannot resist mentioning one other area where some people would deny the right of privacy to every woman in America. And that, of course, is a woman's fundamental right of choice. 
Regardless of whether you are pro-choice or anti-abortion, I believe that for the government, or a judge, or a legislature, or a Supreme Court to tell a woman that she cannot have an abortion, that regardless of whether she's been raped or a victim of incense, incest, that she has no other choice but to bear to full term the seed of an infant just planted in her womb. I believe that is the textbook case of government invading and controlling a person's body. Even the Supreme Court sees it that way. You know, most of you maybe who are anti-abortion don't realize that Roe versus Wade did not condone a woman's right to abortion. It came out for a woman's right of privacy. And writing for the majority in that opinion, Justice William Brennan said, quote, if the right of privacy means anything, it is the right of the individual, married or single, to be free from unwarranted governmental intrusion into matters so fundamentally affecting a person as the decision whether to bear or beget a child. So you see, in its core, the right to choose is not a matter of right to life, it's a matter of an affirmation of the right to privacy. Well, if we have more time, we, you and I together, we could just put up our hands and list all the other invasions of privacy in our lives. Mandatory drug testing at the workplace. Here's something new in California. Having to give your social security number when you go to the DMV to get your license renewed or to register your car. You know what they can do with social security numbers. Having to give your driver's license to uh, any, any store when you write a check and have them write that on the back of the check. Every telephone call you make, every single telephone call you make, those records are an open book, even your calls to the 976 services. Buying a house, buying and renting an apartment, every time you fill out any kind of form with all that information, which we just, we just automatically do. They ask for all this information on his birth date, social security number, license. We all write it down, we hand it in. We don't realize where it's going. We never think about it. Even our trash, the government's got a right, totally uncontrolled, opportunity and right to go to sort through our trash. So don't throw away those love letters, boys and girls. Burn them. <laughs> How about accident reports? I read the paper just last week in the state of Nevada. The legislature was considering a bill that would have restricted access to traffic accident reports. They said it was okay for the party's attorneys or for the insurance companies involved, and of course for the police, but that those reports should not be accessible, this is what the bill said, should not be accessible to other lawyers or other doctors or chiropractors or body shops who were looking for a quick bit of business. That bill was killed on the grounds that access to public records should not be denied. Point is, so much for privacy. Now, for a right so fundamental, that touches on so many aspects of our daily lives, the right of privacy, of course, is fiercely protected. Right? Wrong. The right of privacy is in trouble. Our right of privacy is so often, so widely, so freely ignored, abused, or trashed, it's in danger of disappearing altogether. Consider that in government and private industry data banks today, there are stored over five billion records of every detail of every American's citizen's personal life. Somebody figure that out who's faster than me. It's something like 12 or 15 records per American. Consider that information about each of us is moved from one computer to another in this country five times a day on the average without our permission or knowledge. Consider that every bit of stored knowledge about us is instantly available from original sources or from middle buyers, middlemen. That information is available to anyone willing to pray to pay the price. And then consider, as I pointed out earlier, there is no right of privacy spelled out in the Constitution. There is at best very weak federal laws protecting an individual's right of privacy. And that only 10 out of 50 states protect the right of privacy in their own state constitution. 
And after considering all this, you must come to the same conclusion that I have long ago. It is open season on privacy today. We are all living in glass houses. We are all victims of what someone has called an information free-for-all. But you know, the villain is not the big brother, the big government brother that George Orwell predicted in 1984, the one big government brother who sees all. The villain instead is a proliferation of computer data banks. It's big brother plus all these little brothers that collect, store, and sell information on everything we are and everything we do, from buying a box of diapers to making a telephone call. We are all victims of computer technology that is run amok and out of control. And I believe that unless we act now aggressively to defend our right of privacy, computers are going to make privacy as quaint and as obsolete as the automobile, automobile made the horse and buggy. Unless we stand up and fight for our right of privacy in this age of see all, know all, tell all computers, you know, people are someday going to sit around and wistfully talk about privacy the way some people today sit around and wistfully talk about the quilting bee or barn raisings. As Republicans and as Democrats, as liberals and as conservatives, as Americans all, I don't think we can let this happen. I don't think we can let this happen. We cannot abide this invasion of one of our most basic and most cherished freedoms. In fact, the freedom most valued by civilized men and women. Now, at this point, I would be remiss if I did not, as a television journalist, fess up to something. There's another villain in this piece. The bad guys are not just big government and big computer. The other villain in this piece is the media. The media that cannot resist probing and prying and poking into every aspect of everybody's life. And that takes many, many forms. One of the most odious to me is the local reporter who will run up to the distraught mother and say, and stick the microphone in her face and say, how does it feel? How does it feel that your daughter was just flattened by a big rig on the highway in front of your house? How does it feel? <clears throat> Every time I see that, and I see it all the time, it makes me so angry. That is a gross invasion of privacy. It also takes other forms. What about the national reporters, the so-called leaders in the news business, who turned themselves last year into tabloid journalism? CBS and NBC and ABC and the New York Times and the Washington Post, all the so-called paragons of the media who couldn't resist following the lead of the star in the Inquirer in putting Jennifer Flowers on the front page. Pardon me, but I believe it is Bill Clinton's performance in office that counts, not Bill Clinton's performance in bed. But the media preaches privacy and demands privacy for itself the media refuses to reveal any of its own sources, rightfully so, and yet when it comes to exposing anything about anybody else, the media knows no bounds. Um, so I think we have to remember and insist that the media has no more right to pry than the government. In fact, the media has less right to pry than the government, and we're not doing our job unless we hold the media responsible for its invasions of our privacy as well. Well, at uh, this point, I've talked a little longer than I intended. I'm, I saw the other day, I don't feel too badly about that, however, because I saw the other day at, at USC, there was a new study that was conducted, probably with federal dollars, about the uh, effect on an audience when a speaker drones on for more than 20 minutes. And this study showed that when that happens, a speaker speaks for more than 20 minutes, one-third of the audience falls asleep, one-third of the audience just starts daydreaming, and one-third of the audience uh, starts exercising the wildest sexual fantasies. <laughs> so I don't feel too badly because I've given so many of you so much pleasure for, <laughs> for 
so long. Um, but I, I can't stop without going on to our, the third point is, uh, briefly at least, what can we do about all of this? Is there anything we can do about all of this? Well, <laughs> that's the joy of being a keynote speaker, you see, because all I do, all I get to do is reveal the problem and lay out the problem, and then I walk away and leave it up to you and the speakers that follow over the next three days to solve the problem. But I'm not going to leave you totally in, in the lurch. I can't leave without offering at least a few ideas, in fact, I've got five of them, proposals for action. The first and the most basic is, we have to recognize both the importance of our privacy and the increasing danger of the loss of our privacy. That's, that's the beginning point, it's that awareness. And thanks to uh, this forum, uh, I hope at the end of this, I hope this conference will at least accomplish that wake you up to every one of these modern conveniences and the danger to our personal privacy. The second point is that coming out of this conference, I believe, we've got to be ready to fight for our privacy and to fight to protect the privacy of every other American. And that may mean, and I think it will mean, being willing to pay the price, being willing to sacrifice, being willing to give up some of these new modern conveniences like caller ID if necessary in order to protect our privacy. Willing, even if we are concerned about the traffic in, trafficking in illegal drugs, willing to oppose and resist mandatory testing in every workplace or mandatory testing of every teacher or every student in a, in a, in a, in a, on a college campus just because the government wants to do it. That is a gross invasion of privacy, and if we allow that to happen, our own privacy is more threatened. So we have to be willing to fight to protect our privacy, I believe. Now, what about the computers? Well, remember the movie, uh, The Guys Must Be Crazy? Their problem was a Coke bottle, not a computer. And, and I'm not pretending that we can do with the computer what the chief did with the Coke bottle. You know, we can't kind of walk to the end of the earth and just throw it off the cliff. Um, the computers are here to stay, of course, and it's a good thing they are, but we've got to control the computer before it totally controls or depersonifies or emasculates us. So I think that we have to insist from our government and our business leaders on a new form of privacy in this computer age, what I would call informational privacy. And let me be specific. My third point is, I'd like to see us start demanding federal legislation that prohibits the transfer of any personal information from one data bank to another, whether it's a government data bank or a private data bank, prohibiting transfer of any information on us from one data bank to another without our written permission. They couldn't do it to us physically. They shouldn't be able to do it to us electronically. And fourth, and maybe most diabolical of all, this will really fix them. I think that we should demand legislation that would pay us a royalty every time our name or every time any data about us is used. Now, I am not a famous movie star, but I did appear in a movie once, one of the worst movies ever made, I think, called Out of Bounds. You can pick it up at your video store tonight. The point is, that was about six years ago. It was a Warner Brothers release. Didn't do very well at the box office, but it's done pretty well at the video stores. And about four times a year, I get a check from Warner Brothers for like about $7. If it's a good year, it's maybe a good semester, it's like 12 bucks, right? It doesn't pay the rent. But it's a royalty every time my picture appears on somebody's home television screen. Well, I think, that, I think we should demand the same thing for this computer information. You sell it, you transfer it, any vital information about me, just like actors and actresses and singers, then I ought to get a royalty check in the mail. It's the American way. If they're going to use my name, then at least I ought to get a piece of the action. Very democratic and very American. And finally, one particular challenge that I leave with you today. Knowing this big gap in the federal constitution, 
that I mentioned to you. Recognizing how weak the federal statutes are in this area, 10 states, as I mentioned, 10 states have tried to make up for this lack at the federal level by writing strong right of privacy planks in their state constitutions. The state of California, for example, includes a strong right of privacy clause. So does the state of Montana. So does the state of Washington. The state of Idaho does not. So how fitting if out of this popcorn forum grew not only a recognition of the threats to our privacy today, but a groundswell of citizen support for writing strong protections for the right of privacy into the Idaho state constitution. That's my challenge to you today. You could write the language this week. You could write it this morning. And think how exciting it would be if one or two years from now, either by legislation or initiative, your Idaho state constitution were amended with specific language to affirm and defend the right of privacy. And people could say, hey, I remember. It started right there. It started at NIC. It started at the 23rd annual Popcorn Forum, the week of March 29, 1993. Now, wouldn't that make it all worthwhile? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. I'm open. Yes, sir. What about the good use of computers? For example, some people in this auditorium would say that uh, law enforcement tracking of uh, people uh, is a benefit. How about child support? Uh, law enforcement tracking of uh, delinquent child support payers. What is your opinion upon that? Uh, that would definitely bring upon somebody's rights, whether it be child support or someone that is a uh, excellent point. If you heard the question, the question is what about uh, uh, beneficial or worthwhile uses of the computer, um, noting particularly for, for law enforcement. Well, that's why it's, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, that's why I say we don't throw the computer off the cliff. Uh, I can give you an example in my own life. My car was, uh, I drive a Mustang convertible, and it was broken into a few years ago. Uh, I noticed uh, there were a lot of fingerprints on the window because the man had pried the window open um, to get in and unlock the door. And uh, I wasn't going to report it because all he did was take the small change which I keep in my ashtray, but when I saw the fingerprints, I thought, why not? And I called the LAPD and they said, bring the car over. They dusted the car and they had this guy with their, with their computer fingerprint technology within a day, I think. Yeah, actually, he was already in, in jail for another offense. <laughs> kind of easy to find him, but... Uh, uh, notice, so notice what I said was in my, uh, in my uh, uh, criticism of the intrusion by government or by the computer banks, it's unwarranted. Unwarranted is the word that I used. There are clearly cases where it is warranted, but even then, I think we have to very jealously guard, safeguard our privacy, and the government has to prove why there is a clear and present danger that would, that would authorize um, this invasion of a person's records. The government has to, the government, to my, to my thinking, cannot just seize our telephone records. The government cannot just seize our medical records unless there is a clear reason in terms of our conduct why they need that information. Today it is open season and that's what's wrong. Uh, I might give you one example. Um, I think it was Procter & Gamble recently. They felt that somebody in their company was leaking information about one of their products to a competitor. And they went to the telephone company and the telephone company 
reviewed the phone records of everybody in that phone service area. They went into everybody's computer records, looked at every call made by every individual living in that area to find out who might have been calling this competitor. You know, just gross invasion of the privacy of hundreds of thousands of individuals because one company said, gee, we think somebody made a call to our competitor. You know, that's what, we can't let the government get away with that or big business get away with that. Hi. It is true to my knowledge that doctors can trade records with each other. Plus, also, all of those medical records go into, you know, it used to be the doctor kept his medical records like in an index box, right? I mean, you walked in and he looked up and he said, oh yeah, you were here the last time for a sore throat and I gave you whatever. Well, now, now that everything goes in the computer, that automatically, every prescription you buy, every visit you make is automatically in the computer system, which then automatically goes in this big MIB that's, I think, back in Boston somewhere. And that, that information is sold to anybody who wants it, or given to any government agency that wants it. And the banks can easily get access to that. You, but, but you cannot walk in and get your own medical records. I think you should have a right to. Uh, and walk out with your own medical records. Yes, I would require legislation, either state legislation or federal legislation. But you need both. I think you need one to protect, protect your medical records in the computers so that people cannot have access to that unless you authorize it. And secondly, I certainly think with your physician you should have a right to have your own personal records. Please. Uh, what steps, you mentioned the media, what steps has the media taken or uh, out of the platform form to see the platform? Uh, do you see in your own profession of taking steps to uh, help with the uh, privacy? The media has taken no steps, really, to police itself. You know, like lawyers and like politicians, maybe, and like bankers, I mean, the media are the worst people to police themselves. Um, I think they've got to do it because I would hate to see the alternative, which is, would be to have government police the media. Um, but I think, that, I think that is the threat, unless the media starts to exercise some responsibility. The only thing that I do about it is, you see, my job on television is a, is a commentator, meaning I get to give my opinion, you know, like John Chancellor used to do on NBC every night. And whenever I see any invasions of privacy, either by the printed press or the, or the broadcasting, electronic media, um, I usually get on television and blast them for it and at least try to shame them into acting more responsibly. Um, we have a situation that's not quite related, but in Los Angeles today, you might have heard of Rodney King. <laughs> <laughs> and you might know we have a second Rodney King trial underway now. And of course, everyone recognizes that if there was one riot once, if these four policemen are found not guilty again, there is the possibility that there could be trouble again. Um, but the, the, the media in Los Angeles today is actually acting very, very irresponsibly in my judgment, and I've been criticizing them for that because they're not just reporting the possibility of another riot or talking about that. They're, I think they're actually going out and fanning the flames for another riot. They're going out into, the, into South Central Los Angeles and other areas and asking people the question, well, what are you going to do when, this, when the next riot starts? No. Uh, did you buy a gun yet to protect yourself against the next riot? I mean, that, that is totally irresponsible. And, and they're doing it, and I believe that there is no riot the next time that the, some members of the media are going to be greatly disappointed. They won't sell as many newspapers, their ratings will not be as high. It's, it's, it is related, not exactly right on topic, but the media's got to exercise its own responsibility or else there's going to be censorship of the media, which uh, I don't think any of us want. In the back there and then here. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, would you uh, explain what a caller ID is? Is it a type of phone or is it something else? I'm sorry. Um, caller ID is a type of phone. It's a special phone instrument, and it flashes the number of the person who's calling you. The idea is that when the phone rings, you look and see if you recognize a number. And if you recognize the number of a friend, for example, then you'll take the call. If you don't recognize the number, 
um, you know, you won't take the call. You let your machine take it or you just let the phone ring. And it, 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 it does appeal because you say, oh, well, at least I can sort out all those crazy calls I, I don't want to take and I'll just talk to people that I want to talk to. But the reverse is, as I point out, that anytime you make a call, anybody you're calling knows who you are and what your telephone number is. And with your telephone number, they'll know everything else about you. It's easy to find out everything else about you. So you call a, a travel agency to make an inquiry. They've got your number. They find out who you are, how much money you spend on travel, where you like to fly or whatever. And the next thing you know, you're getting pounded by uh, uh, you know, uh, hotels in Kauai who are offering you their seven-day best rate or something. I don't know. Um, but now, here's, here's what's happening with that. The phone company is saying, oh, OK, we'll let you cancel. On your, we'll let you put something on your phone so that you can cancel your number from being seen by somebody else. But of course, that will cost you extra. You see, it's the convenience that they'll provide, but it costs you extra for the privacy. Baloney. Baloney. It's just like having an unlisted phone number. It costs you extra to have an unlisted phone number. I know. <laughs> yes? Pardon me, so I guess on that, if caller ID has not been foisted upon you by your local phone company, uh, then at least maybe you'll have a chance to stop it here. We're trying to stop it in California and haven't always succeeded. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering if in the debate over national health care, if this wouldn't be an Uh, the, the question is if, if this, with the debate over national health care, isn't this the time to do something about uh, protecting access to medical records? Uh, yes, and I'll tell Hillary the next time I talk to her. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I, I'm not too sanguine about that. I think the problems with health care are so immense, and particularly the question of how do you provide insurance to the 37.5 million Americans who have no health insurance whatsoever today, that I haven't heard any discussion yet about access to medical records. It would be an ideal time. They may be too bogged down with other details to, uh, to be able to touch that. Excellent point, though. Uh, one more. Oh, my. <laughs> Go ahead. Back to your point about the media and the lack of responsibility, you're doing your part, but what other times have the pressure in place on them to change Excellent question. Let me tell you. You know, you may not think this, but the media is responsive to demands and to outrage and to calls from the general public. Uh, I can tell you that. I work both in radio and television. Um, and um, you, you have to understand, news, we're talking news now, right? I mean, news is a business like any other business. The people that are in it are in there to provide information, but they're basically in there to make money. And money means ratings. And ratings means people watching. And if there is enough citizen outrage about the violence that's on the show, un unnecessary violence, you know, blood and bodies all over the screen, um, they'll change it. Our station has. If there's enough um, outcry about obscenities or filth or, um, you know, nudity in the, in the screen, sometimes you see that in the news, they'll change it. And if there's enough outrage about invasions of persons' privacy, and that means to your average citizen plus, I believe, public figures. Um, then the media, then the media will change it. It just takes people have just got to keep pounding on them, pounding on them. Call the television station. You know, I never did. I never thought about until I worked in television. Never thought about calling a television station and complaining. But I have to tell you, it happens all the time. You know, you'll have a bad story, and the switchboard will light up. We just have to. There's Maxine. <laughs> you just have to keep doing more of that. More of that, more of that, and it does work. You will get a response, so it's important. You know, you can you can do that by keeping keeping your media honest and keeping them from sticking their noses into other people's business. Thank you very very much. Thank you. Very much. Have a great time.